default. That's what I want, the default. Well, just explicitly pick it, shall we? Okay, no audio. Okay, I see what looks like audio now registering. Better? Better? Yes, okay. No idea what's going on, but you know, I have been doing so many different things with uh, different setups, different setting up my microphone, not setting up my microphone, a couple different computers, using my phone, all sorts of different things. So, so uh, yeah, sorry for um, <clears throat> sorry for the noise and the, the, the lack of content here. All right, good. Um, so, uh, did I say all my business stuff? Yeah, my weekly series is every Wednesday, um, and I'm glad to see some of you have coffee. I think I have like one sip left of my morning coffee. All right, so, um, and so as always, I will be uh, entertaining any uh, questions that you all have on any topic whatsoever, because why not? Um, I'm just here to chat. Um, but I always come in with uh, something I want to talk about, and I spend most of the time kind of talking about that. And uh, the topic that I want to talk about today is music theory, because, well, for a number of reasons, as many of you know, I just launched a music theory course, and yeah, blah, 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 I'll, get, I'll give you the commercial for that uh, uh, at some point. But um, it, it was sort of interesting to me that as big as music theory is in kind of my life and what I do and what I normally spend my time talking about, and I've spent a fair amount of time talking about it in these cafe sessions, when I actually looked over the list, by the way, this is like number 90 or something, so, so someone should remind me uh, in 10 weeks, or I should put it on my calendar, that that'll be the 100th episode. That'll be kind of cool. Um, anyhow, uh, th there wasn't one specific episode just dedicated to talking about music theory. Um, you know, there were plenty where they, that was a, a, a topic, but not specifically. Um, so anyhow, uh, music theory is, it's interesting because when I started, uh, when I took piano lessons as a, as a kid, I mean, I started when I was maybe six years old, um, my piano teacher, and this was just like this total coincidence, you know, they wanted to give me piano lessons, find the, find the person in the neighborhood who teaches piano lessons. And it turns out <clears throat> the woman who lived two houses away, who t taught piano lessons is a, was a composition a professor at the Hart School of Music in uh, in Connecticut, where I was growing up. And so I got two lessons a week. I'd have a private piano lesson every week, and I would have a theory lesson every week. That would be with her other students. I think she grouped them like by age groups or something. So I was in one group, and I think there were other, there was another group too. So I got, I started to learn about music theory starting at age six, you know, you know, from a composition professor. It was like really learning the stuff. Um, so it's been part of my life all along. And um, uh, it continued to be, I mean, a lot of people you learn it and then you're like, well, what am I going to do with this? And to be honest, I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but I did do, um, I did do a uh, composition because she would have us do composition projects as part of the uh, um, part of the lessons, part of the theory uh, lessons that we did. Um, but then it was once uh, I moved from Florida, moved from Connecticut to Florida, and then when I went into high school and they drafted me into the high school jazz band, like we had a, the stage band, they call it, basically a, a jazz big band. And because the pianist who had been playing in that uh, graduated, I didn't know one thing about jazz, um, but uh, they knew I played the piano because I played clarinet in marching band, and so some of the people who were in both uh, said, hey, you, you play piano, you should come join us uh, in jazz band. And that's when I suddenly realized, oh, all this theory stuff that I've been learning is something that I can apply now on a, on a regular basis in, uh, in just ordinary playing, not just composing or whatever that is. Um, so anyhow, there's just so many things to talk about as far as what theory is, what it's good for. And yet, since this has been my life for so long, I've had so many different conversations with people about this and so many different, um, I don't know, uh, different attitudes that I encounter. Um, uh, and so there's just, you know, there's people I know who are jazz players who don't really know any theory and totally played by ear. And... Um, and this is a completely valid way of playing, and yet 
we there end up being these sort of like debates in the community. Oh, is it better to use theory? Is it better to use your ear? I'm going to claim you're always using theory. I mean, if whether you're using your ear or not, whether whether you're always using your ear and you're always using theory, it's just a question of how much consciousness you have about these things. So anyhow, I'm just going to kind of um, blather on about miscellaneous things. But at some point, I'm going to tell you about my course and I'm going to drop something. Um, so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to do the drop thing right now because uh, because it's too cool not to do. So um, I'm going to do it with my phone. And um, I'm going to go full screen on this guy. Now I think mm, that might have made me go full screen. No, it did not. That didn't either. All right, I used to have a shortcut set up for that. All right, so I need to go full screen and back up a tiny bit. So I can give this little demonstration. Um, oh, are you guys seeing that? No, you're you're yeah, you're just seeing my face, right? Yeah, because you're. I think you are. Let me make sure we're all seeing the same thing. Good. All right. So music theory. Um, the deal is music theory. We often talk about it as being like rules for things, <clears throat> and I'm not opposed to the word rules. And I've given some version of this speech enough times that I'm sure some of you have heard it before. Um, I'm sure Colleen has. Oh, actually, I'm not sure you have. But um, uh, yeah, okay. I I can I can buy into the idea of music theory being a set of rules in some sense. But the sense in which it, I could say it's a set of rules, the rules we're talking about are not like rules that tell you you can't rob banks or you can't commit murder or you must pay your taxes or you or you have to have a driver's license in order to drive whatever they're not rules that tell you what you must do or what you must not do that music music theory is not that you do whatever you want in music so that is not what rules are the rules in music are like the law of gravity and this is why I said I'm gonna drop something so this is my phone um oops and that is my phone with Siri because I grabbed it by the button. Okay, so uh, I have my phone here. The law of gravity tells me if I drop this phone, it will fall, right? If I drop this phone, boom, gravity did its job. Gravity is not something you can choose to follow or not follow. You, you have no choice in the matter. It's, so it's not like a law that says, you know, you, you've got to have a driver's license to drive, but then you could choose to drive without the license. It's just against the law. You can't go against the law of gravity. You can't make this not want to fall if you drop it. What you can do is you can choose not to drop it. You can just choose to put it back in your pocket. So, you, you know, gravity doesn't care if you drop it or not. It also doesn't care if you do clever little things like catching it before it hits the ground so it didn't hit the ground well you didn't circumvent gravity in any way gravity still did its job or if I take this thing and I throw it up or throw it to the other side of the of the camera there okay it went up it came back down if I was really clever I might have a shelf oh I do have a shelf I have a cat shelf over here I don't really want to throw my phone onto it though so I think I'm not gonna do that um, I don't want to throw my because the cats will be on it and they'll play with whatever I put up there. But anyhow, I could throw something and it might land on the shelf and not fall. Anyhow, I can get in an airplane. It flies, right? There's all sorts of things that I can do that um sort of like play with this tendency of gravity to pull things down. You know, I can I can use the aerodynamics to make things go up and uh, but they're still acted on by gravity. All these things that I can do do not change. The fact that gravity is gravity, and this phone wants to fall if I drop it. Um, so this is what rules are in music theory. Um, they are things that tell you this is just how it is. You, you, it doesn't matter. You, you can choose to. So if I tell you the five chord likes to resolve to the one chord in tonal music, if you're creating music in a certain context and you put in a five chord, and resolve it to one, it's gonna sound good. Just like if I drop this, it's gonna fall. That's, you can't change that. You could choose not to resolve that five chord to one, just like I can choose not to drop this phone. But it doesn't change the fact that that's where that five chord wanted to go, just like it doesn't change, gravity isn't gonna change. I, If I drop this, it is gonna wanna fall. 
if I resolve five to one, it is going to sound good. So gravity is a good analogy uh, in my mind for uh, for music theory because it really does talk about this idea that it just is. It, it has no idea whether you know about gravity or not. You might have never been taught that gravity is a thing, but somehow intuitively you eventually learn through experience that um, when you uh, when you drop something, it falls. If you jump out of a tree, you hit, hit the ground, right? You, you learn these things. Um, so whether you know the law of gravity or not is irrelevant. You're still subject to it. So whether you know music theory or not, doesn't matter. You're still subject to it. So this is, um, I don't know, this is uh, some of, of the stuff that I uh, talk about um, when I talk about theory. Is It's, it's trying to describe what is because if I were to define music theory I would say it's the study of what is in music it's what music sounds like why it sounds that way why is maybe a tricky word but um the study of things like that if you do if you do this it will sound good if you do this it probably won't sound as good um and good bad these are cultural things because what does it mean to sound good well that depends different people think different things sound good right so some of this is good within a context um, like any of you who actually studied like music theory at say the college level you remember maybe a rule about parallel fifths and why they're bad or maybe not even why they're bad just that they're bad so um uh um the idea with parallel fifths being bad is they're bad if you're trying to create this particular sound of how common practice period part writing worked. But parallel fifths are suddenly good if you want to play power chords on your rock and roll tune, because that's what they are, is parallel fifths. So, um, <clears throat> uh, that's a bunch of talk. I, I, I'm going to play some music a little bit talk about what theory is, and by all means ask questions. If you have theory questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, I've been a little fascinated with this piece lately because i got a student who's working on it. Many of you probably know this guy. Uh, I'll, I'll just start it playing. Oh, uh, so that's way too fast, right? Um, Alt-Shift-Alt-T is the tempo thing. I, I, that's a, the default tempo of 80 is probably good. And that's as far as this person got in entering. I, I, I don't actually remember. I must have downloaded this from musecore.com at some point. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very well-known Chopin piece. Um, by the way, something I should know this kind of stuff. I should have known this stuff longer than I have known it. But, you know, Chopin did um, a variation of the same thing that Bach did. Uh, Bach very famously wrote a prelude and fugue in all 12 major and minor keys the well-tempered clavier. In fact, he did it twice. Um, so uh, to kind of prove it could be done because at the time there were, you know, the different systems of tuning weren't necessarily such that you could write music in any key and have it work. Um, so uh, uh, just getting my, I don't know why actually on my phone I'm not even seeing that I'm live right now. That, that bothers me a little bit, so I need to figure that out, but uh, I'll figure that out later. Um, uh, so Bach did it to kind of prove it could be done and prove it was possible, you know, that for people who are doubting the value of tuning instruments in such a way that you could play in any key and have it sound relatively in tune, Bach wanted to show, hey, here's, here's a set of music that uh, is going gonna, is gonna to work. Um, so Chopin also wrote a prelude, uh, not a fugue, but a, a prelude in um, every uh, key to kind of, uh, I don't know if the show is going to be done. It was a well-established fact by then, but just to do it. So this is the E minor um, prelude. Okay. Uh, the volume of the music, you mean? Oh, you know what? That's because, well, actually, I would have thought, um, 
Oh, everything is down, really. Uh, did I turn down my volume? No, I didn't turn down. I, it says I'm sending pretty good. I mean, look at that signal strength. I mean, I'm I'm almost I'm almost clipping. Um, so I'm, yeah, not totally sure what might be up with that. But I can tell you what I can do. I'll, I I don't want to. This is my uh, new microphone. Well, new as of a few weeks ago, anyhow. And I use it for some things, but I I wasn't going to be using it for this because it seemed like. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm not sure. So YouTube, uh, yeah, cause YouTube has its own volume control that's separate from the system volume. How many people, is anyone else having volume issues? Cause I, when I'm looking at this again, I'm, I'm afraid to turn up more cause that, that sucker looks like just shy of clipping to me. Um, and it, and most people are saying that volume sounds good, but if the vol if the mix between my voice and the music isn't good, that's something I can play with. But I have it set the way I normally do. Um, but sometimes I I mute the desktop audio. I'm going to do that and see if that makes a difference. Did the sound of my voice just change at all for anyone? And if I play some music again, I'm going to slow this down a little bit. Maybe make it seventy two. All right, so I had previously determined, based on doing a similar test like this, that setting my computer's audio speaker output at 32 seemed like it was uh, doing the right thing. But it, this depends on what uh, it depends on a whole, a whole bunch of different things. So, yeah, um, I keep playing with stuff because I've been mentioning I've been recording videos, and I've been okay. I've been recording videos for my online course, which I guess I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Um, but also because now I'm doing much more teaching online because of coronavirus. Um, so like the school where I teach, Regis University, like most schools at this point, is all online. So I spent all morning yesterday teaching private lessons via Zoom. So um, that's, and so then I have a different setup that I use for that as far as how I, how I have to set things up. So I, every, everything's uh, just crazy and different. So, um, so yeah, uh, feel free to keep giving me feedback. So anyhow, uh, this is a uh, the E minor prelude and kind of uh, famously it's very similar to a uh, piece by Antonio Carlos Jobim uh, called Insensites or uh, How Insensitive is the uh, English English uh, title and that tune um, is <sighs> reminiscent enough that I'm pretty sure there's probably no debate um, that it probably was, um, based in some way on this prelude, but it's not directly. One of the great yeah, challenges yeah, in this world yeah. is knowing enough about a subject and I do like to think you're yeah, right. But... Oh, God. This is coming from the movie. That's not what I was looking for at all. All right. <clears throat> so, um, anyhow, uh, that was a mistake. Um, the song. So let's try. I, I want it. Oh, Jaws of Bafta. That'll be. That'll be good. Um, so this piece. Um, once the melody starts, you'll hear is very reminiscent. So just that much. So that's about all that you can play and say, oh yeah, yeah, it seems related. But it seems so related when you really look, even looking at some of the details of it, that it, it's very likely um, to have been the case. Um, both uh, Jobim, who wrote that piece, Antonio Carlos Jobim, and uh, Chopin, at least in this piece, are 
extremely, extremely concerned with the subject of voice leading. So uh, one of the things I said I was going to be talking about here is, well, what does what does it does it mean to talk about music theory? Am I I'm not even showing you the music. So uh, let me let me flip back now to full screen because uh, I just realized you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Here we go. So here's the music for uh, the prelude. So um, when I say that he's very concerned with the subject of voice leading, uh, voice leading is one of the main terms that we use in music theory. So let me step back for a second. If I talk about what music theory is, I don't know, I could give you about a half a dozen things maybe. Let, let's see, voice leading is one of them. Voice excuse me, voice leading, I would say, is the study of melody, the study of what makes a melody sound smooth and good. Um, and usually the connotation is a little more on the smooth than the interesting. We're always looking for a balance between the expected and the unexpected in music. How to have something that's expected enough to sound familiar, unexpected enough to sound interesting. This is the quintessential st um, struggle or challenge or whatever thing that we deal with in music. We want to create something that sounds expected enough to be familiar and pleasant and unexpected enough to be interesting and not just disappear into the background and be forgettable. So um, when we talk about voice leading, typically the connotation of the term is more on the side of the expected and familiar and then it's when we do things that are against the rules of voice leading that we make something more interesting and again it's not against any more than the, the, the law of gravity blah 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 it just means i chose to do something you know voice leading rules tell me if you do this it's going to sound smooth so every once in a while i choose not to do this so it isn't as smooth and then i get something interesting um okay all right good to know that uh firefox extension sound fixer raised the, the volume okay so yeah, I don't, I don't know what would have been going on, but maybe it, maybe it is a Firefox-specific thing then. Um, or it could be your own special brand of uh, Linux that I know you're... Um, or not even Linux, right? It's just your own brand of Unix of some kind, I think. BSD base? I don't even remember. Um, so when I talk about voice leading in the context of this piece, if you look at the melody, okay, we've got a big octave leap. Voice leading say voice leading rules say yeah that that generally sounds good as far as big leaps go octaves are good ones other big leaps are unexpected sounding um, so we have this big leap of an octave um, and then after this the melody right. Every single note in that melody has been by step. This is quintessentially great voice leading. You don't improve on moving by step in, in, in the rules of voice leading. In fact, it's so quintessentially great voice leading that it is in danger of being boring because it doesn't do anything but, but, but move by step. What makes, what rescues it from boring is the, the use of some little bits of chromaticism like we have here, but mostly what rescues it is the harmonies are so rich and so interesting that they become the interest, maybe more than the melody. And from a voice leading perspective, um, This is a C natural. Um, there's a courtesy accent. Oh, that should be. Right? It's all by step in that top voice. Middle voice. Middle voice all by step, bottom voice. No, actually, I'm in the wrong octave. Right? This is 
every single voice in this piece. It's a four voice piece. Everything that happens is moving by step, and yet the harmonies are so rich. We have this E minor triad, then this thing that's called a suspension, and this, this idea of how the chords work, and that this is a one chord in the key of E minor. And then we're moving now to the five chord. It's a B chord, but this E, this note that doesn't really belong in the chord, it's left over from the previous chord. A B chord doesn't normally have an E in it, but we had that E left over from the previous chord, and we let it sound for a little bit, left over, it's a little out of place, sounds a little tense, and then it resolves. That is just a classic technique that goes back to the Renaissance. I'm trying to get the right octave, but it's at the top of my range. This moment where is being suspended, and then it falls like gravity um, down to its proper pitch. And then we have this extra little tension here, with this note that's not in the chord, but it goes up a half step and then it comes back down. In jazz terms, this is the flat nine. And jazzers love them, we love me a flat nine. Um, or I love me a flat nine. Um, but in classical terms, we could also look at this chord and say, oh, well, it's a fully diminished seventh chord. So all this stuff that I'm talking about of how the chords work. Um, for the first two measures, I would say Chopin is doing nothing unusual. For the first two chords, there's nothing in there that Haydn wouldn't have done, for instance. By the time we hit this chord, this chord is pretty rich. We've got this F natural and this tritone between that F and the B and this interval, this augmented sixth interval from the F to the D sharp. There's all sorts of interesting harmonic things going on there. And as soon as I talk about this augmented sixth interval, this uh, suggests what is often called the, an augmented sixth chord, and in particular a French augmented sixth chord because of the presence of the B, and yet Chopin's use, and so it's it's a common enough thing to have a name. I don't know that Haydn was a big uh, augmented sixth guy, uh, maybe a little bit, but definitely Mozart um, and Beethoven you get just a little bit later, and it's definitely a huge part of the language. Um, you don't see so many augmented sixth chords in Bach. Um, I think there's like just a handful of examples, as I recall. Um, but uh, certainly by mid-classical era, uh, the idea of the augmented sixth chord is pretty well established. But Chopin's use of it is a little interesting because w the, the specific place he's putting it is not where it's expected. It's actually, uh, it. Uh, uh, if I... Uh, well, there's a number. I have to establish a bunch of things to tell you what's unexpected about it. But what it should have been is it should have had a C. The, the traditional augmented sixth chord in the key of E minor would have had a C on the bottom, gone up to an A sharp, and uh, then would have resolved to a B chord. It would have resolved to the five chord. Here, he is taking this chord that's like a fourth higher than that. So instead of resolving to a B chord, it's resolving to an E chord, and it does it in this really crazily indirect manner in which usually it's the other way around. It's this chord. It's usually this chord, then resolving to this chord, then resolving to that chord. So he's actually resolving a little backwards for a moment before giving you the, the real resolution. So it's all sorts of just really interesting stuff that Chopin is doing. None of this is against theory. I mean, you can't change the fact that this chord expected to go one place and then Chopin chose to go somewhere different with it, but he's taking advantage of good voice leading to make this happen. So all this kind of stuff is all these little things that theory tells you if you do this, this is going to happen, but we also know you can do this and this other thing will happen and then we can play with these things and next thing you know you have an airplane that can fly despite the law of gravity telling you, man, that sucker weighs tons there's nothing holding it up. It should be falling. And yet we also know there's aerodynamics and that can make the thing fly. So anyhow, all of this, so voice leading is the study of the connection, smooth connecting of melodies. Harmony is this, the, the, the uh, sub study of how 
uh, chords go together. And then we have counterpoint, which is maybe the study of independent melodies working together. If I um, showed you a, a an actual fugue, um, which I'm sure I have one uh, somewhere. I used to have a fugue somewhere. Um, Ah, well, I've got a, a little one of, of my uh, big band fugues here. Um, so, uh, and, and then, I'll, then I'll give you my um, course um, commercial because I got to do that. Um, so this piece here, oh my God, I'm playing big band from 1.2? That's not possible. I didn't write it that long ago, did I? Holy crap. So this is like a really old version of this big band score I did. Um, uh, so um there's the letter r no i thought it was the letter r um oh i think because it's so old they're not even recognized as rehearsal letters is the deal since it came in from such an old version these rehearsal letters didn't come through as such so i'm just gonna play a little of this you can hear a little of a few Okay, uh, what's happening is, oh, that's fine, it'll be okay. It was the rhythm section parts, slash notation wasn't a thing in 1.2 either, so I'm hearing playback of that. So anyhow, that is a, it's not a whole fugue, but it's a, 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 certainly a section that's using fugal techniques, and in particular, the idea of counterpoint, where we have this melody, the, the original melody. Is the melody of this piece, and yet every other voice then enters a couple of beats later. And then this guy enters two beats later. And then someone else enters a couple beats later. And so this whole staggered entrance of this melody where the parts independently are kind of imitating each other, but when you line them all up, it forms interesting things harmonically. And that's all um, the study of counterpoint. Um, so these are maybe the three biggies, if I'm going to talk about what music theory entails. It entails the study of voice leading, what makes an interesting melody, the study of harmony, how chords fit together, and the study of counterpoint, how independent melodies can uh, work together. So it kind of combines the study of, uh, of voice leading and harmony in a way to talk about counterpoint. Um, yeah, and then we can also work rhythm into there and talk about theories, theories of, of uh, how rhythm works and what makes certain rhythms work the way they do. So all of these have to do with what theory is and what and uh, and uh, how music, what makes music sound good and why it sounded good to have this chord followed by this chord rather than this chord followed by that chord or why these notes were there and when we talk about why yeah I don't know why we can't always really say why we can more say if then like I don't have to know why gravity is a thing to understand gravity at, at a practical level I, I don't understand gravity I mean why why should the earth be pulling things towards it why I, I, I can't actually tell you. I can tell you that it does, and it accelerates at 32 feet per second squared. I can tell you all the stuff about it. I can calculate things having to do with it. But I cannot really answer the deeper question of why gravity is a thing. And I, I guess it's the same with music. I can't really get that deep. Gravitons, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Um, but what what is that really? I mean, quarks and and uh, waves and all sorts of things. And and we keep changing our understanding of fundamental physics. And what I the way I learned it in in high school is not the way we people learn it now. Um, you know, and uh, yeah. So there's all this all this stuff to learn about it, right? Um, and it's similarly with with music there's like certain things we could talk about the frequencies of the notes and the overtone series and how that might I keep holding my ear because there is something about 
vibrations and how the eardrum is affected by the overtone series and stuff that yeah we, we there's probably physiological things that could be explained just like we can talk about gravitons but they they end up not being all that relevant to to really what we m normally care about so anyhow um music theory is all of these things it's a huge huge topic that we're constantly learning about and as an improviser it's like almost magic that we can do this i mean it's, it's i think one of the most amazing things in the world is that i i can sit down at a piano not just me but thousands of jazz pianists across the country across the world probably millions across the world can sit down at a piano and take uh, a chord progression and play that chord progression using interesting voicings in their left hand and improvise new melodies in their right hand all in real time never having played that piece before never having thought about that chord progression before but are just making things happen and it sounds good and it's it is it, it is just mind-boggling mind-bogglingly god i can't even say the word um but you know what i'm trying to say um complex what is actually going on uh to make that happen and yet jazz pianists do this all the time and not just pianists but saxophonists and everyone else but pianists have to juggle that many more um balls because we're playing the chords too um and yet there's pianists who do this with relatively little theory training and it's by ear but yeah they 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 know you drop a ball it falls down to the ground whether they can tell you you know i can't tell you exactly about the whole graviton business if that's even the right word that sounds star trekky to me i don't know um but uh um I can't tell you about that, but I can tell you 32 feet per second squared, etc. I can tell you some of the physics of how we measure it and how to calculate relative to it. Um, so I at least know that much. Um, and similarly for music theory, I can't tell you the, all the physiological acoustics study of it. I can tell you a little bit about it, but not much. Um, but I can certainly tell you um, about this chord resolving to that chord. I can tell you at that level. Some people can't tell you that, but they still know if you drop this ball, it's going to fall. If you drop it from a higher distance, it's going to fall harder. They, you know, we we, we kind of intuitively know that. If you drop a piece of paper, it's going to kind of flutter down, and we're not exactly sure why, unless you have studied a little bit and realize, oh well, that's air resistance overcoming, you know, a, a counter force, etc. So um, all these different things. Uh, so blah 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 blah. I I now want to at least um, give you the. Uh, what am I looking for? I'm looking for this guy here. Um, so at the top of uh, top of my um, chat, you should be seeing the pinned message with the link to the course if you haven't seen it already. And I want to tell you what this course is and how it fits into this picture. So the online course um, is here and this is the the page that you will go to when you first click it and it kind of tells you more about it and it's got a lovely video and so most of you have probably already seen the video because if you subscribe you already got notification that the video was there and and uh oh boy it's a premiere um so anyhow you watch the video a minute and 45 seconds tells you tells you everything you need to know about the course um and even just the screenshot tells you a good chunk of what you need to know about the course the course is set up to teach you not all of that stuff that I've been talking about. It's a huge, huge topic. I call this course basic music theory. The idea is just to understand the language that I've been using, to understand if I talk about a five chord going to one chord, just knowing, well, what, what do you mean by a five chord? Or if I say, oh, well, that D sharp going to D, that's good voice leading. Well, what, what does that mean? Why is step good voice leading? Or what, what does that mean? All of these terms I'm using, or, or how do I even know what the key of E minor is? I'm talking about key of E minor like you know what that is. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe, you know, so these are the basic terminology, uh, the structure of things. Is, so just knowing what the different minor scales are, what the different major scales are, how they relate to the key signatures. Why are there only, why, why is a major scale a thing? Who, who decided that those seven notes in those, in that order should be a thing? Who decided that if we start those same seven notes somewhere else, that that should be a thing and we call it minor? And who came up with this crazy idea that says if you raise that seventh note of a minor scale and you have a D sharp instead of a D natural, who decided that, that should be a thing? And then who decided that we should also raise the C and call it C sharp? But oh, by the way, on the way down, lower, all this stuff that is, um, that's melodic minor if you have, for people who haven't already learned about that. 
all of the, these concepts, knowing what the scales are, why they're the way they are, a little bit about why, because um, otherwise they're just things. And I, to me, knowing the why is kind of important. So why the major scale is what it is, what all the major scales are, how they relate, how the key signatures relate to each other, um, and then how the, the major keys relate to the minor keys, what, what's going on with that whole raised seventh and, and all this stuff, and then what the different chords are, what triads are, what the different inversions of triads are, and, and why we care about that, why, uh, you know, and then seventh chords and all these different kinds of chords that we have, this idea of putting Roman numerals, we can talk about a one chord and a five chord. This is basic music theory. I say it's basic because this is just the foundation, you know, then uh, what goes on on top of that. Oh, that was me scrolling. Never mind. Um, what goes on on top of that is then like if I tell you five likes to go to one, well, that's great. That's one really interesting bit of not just this basics fundamental stuff, but it's like, oh, now we're really talking about something. But that's only one thing. I can tell you a lot more than just five goes to one, but then it's getting into a little more advanced study of harmony. But in order for me to get any more advanced and telling you five likes to go to one, you need to understand all this stuff about how the scales work and how, how we build triads, how we build seventh chords, how we number them in you know Roman numeral notation and things like that. So the idea of my basic music theory course is to just totally, totally get you absolutely familiar with all of those concepts of, um, well, you can even, well, this is, uh, you're, you're seeing just uh, the beginning here uh, where part of it is talking about rhythm and how ties work and tuplets and um, different patterns that exist in rhythm that tell you the notation rules, like when it's okay to beam two notes together, uh, this, this idea that sometimes a note that straddles the middle of the bar line, you're supposed to divide it up with a tie. That's all part of, uh, part of these, uh, lessons in there. So the, like the full, uh, curriculum starts off with just basics about how notation works, uh, basics about pitches, uh, note names and accidentals. And this gets into the historical, well, why are things that way? How did we end up with, with 12 notes in a, in a scale? How did we decide that seven of them were important enough to be white keys and big notes on a piano? And then why are these other five, these little black keys way tucked back there? How did that all come about? And then, you know, reading these different clefts, all that, all that is part of it. And then again, talking about rhythm, talking about uh, meter and why six, eight, uh, in six eight, you may know it's not just one two three four five six one two three four five six, but it's one and a two and a one and a two and a, and talking about this as compound meter and what that's about. So there's there's things about how meter, how rhythm works, um, that idea. Like I said, that um, I'll just go ahead and click that. Um, yeah, the, this is actually one of the longest uh, lessons I got here um, on the rhythmic patterns because it's talking about all the, these things of how you would break up um, rhythms so that you can see the two halves of the, uh, the measure independently and things like that. So that's all um, part of the study of rhythm that I have in my course. Um, so um, yeah, and then I go on and talk about major scales and keys and the circle of fifths and how that relates to key signatures. And um, and then talking about the chromatic scale and the intervals and constructing intervals that if someone asks you to make a, a minor seventh below G sharp, you know how to do that. Um, and then I start talking about consonance and dissonance because this is now where we start getting into the laying the groundwork for talking about harmony and counterpoint and so forth. Um, and then I talk about the minor scales and the different, you know, Dorian minor versus Nat the Aeolian minor, and then the harmonic and melodic minors and all the key signatures that go with that and all this business. And then I talk about triads and I talk about inversions and Roman numeral analysis and seventh chords and chord symbols and stuff. So this is what the course all entails. Um, and um, the thing to know about the course, um, so... Let me, let me come back to that question in one second. I want to emphasize that I have chosen for now, at least, while we're all in this uh, kind of, um, you know, stay at home under lockdown. Some of us have maybe don't have our regular income coming in. We're spending a little more time dealing with online study and have, trying to make things work. I'm making the course available for free if you want. So when you scroll down to the bottom of the uh, course, 
page, you will see that there's a regular price on the course, but then all you gotta do is click here where it says free, pay what you want, and then enroll in course, and you will be enrolled for free. And then you'll have the op option of, uh, of helping me because, you know, I, I spent the last year <laughs> creating this course while I was doing other things. But uh, it it's, uh, was a huge, huge undertaking creating it. And I want to make it available to everyone. But, you know, so if people are in a position to help me out with that, great. But I also want to make it available to everyone. So there you go. That option is there. So, um, so I did just finish the basic one. However, I've got... I, let me tell you about my plans here. So one thing is, I've also created this sort of site subscription so that as new courses become available, you, you get access to them immediately. But I also know that, well, that's going to take a while. And so as a way of creating more advanced material um, immediately without having to wait until I have a whole course, because I'm my god this was a lot of oh I, I i work putting this together like when here you see that this particular lesson involved three videos uh each of the videos is like you know 15 minutes 10 10 15 minutes long so this 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 is probably the longest lesson in the entire uh course because it's three separate videos most of them are just one um but then there's these handouts that go with it and the handouts are all within MuseScore. hello So that these handouts are all you can play back and all. Um, <clears throat> and then I have these worksheets where you can download the, you can go to MuseScore.com and download the worksheet and then you can write in your answers or complete the worksheet within MuseScore, etc. So it, it was unbelievable amounts of work putting this course together. Um, so yeah, that I do have several ideas for advanced courses. I want to do them on these separate topics though. Instead of just calling it advanced uh, music theory, I want to say, no, let's study harmony specifically. Let's study voice leading specifically. Let's study counterpoint specifically. Let's count, study rhythm specifically. And then, you know, they, they relate to each other. And so I know people will want to take multiple courses on them, but I, I want to be able to focus on kind of one at a time and get deep enough into that subject without getting too wrapped up in another. So I know it's going to take a while to get all those courses together. But so what I've decided to do is I've created what I'm calling a master class. And I talked about that at some point a while ago. Um, and, in, and in the master class, I can just post whatever I want, whenever I want. I'll just post a lesson and say, hey, this is what I feel like talking about today. It's kind of like this, but but more a little more structured um, where I can post a lesson and say, okay, this is, I'm demonstrating this thing, and then have people say, all right, now I'm going to go do my homework on that and post their their results, and then I'll comment on uh, on those things, on, on what people have done. And and it's like a public class, which is why I call it a master class, because it's if you, if you know like the master class format, there's like a one person performs, the teacher stands there, and then they kind of critique the performer in front of the rest of the class, and then someone else comes up and they do the same thing. So it's roughly similar to that. So like, remember, I don't know if you were, uh, Mike, paying attention, if you were here when I uh, did the demo of uh, Pathetique. I, I took the second movement of Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata, and I did kind of a jazz interpretation of it. I did a cafe where I started talking about voice leading, I think, actually. Um, and then I got inspired by that to do a whole reharmonization of it. Um, and then I made a video of that. And then I made a video of explaining how I created uh, this re reharmonization. And I put the first part of it on YouTube, but the rest of it went into that master class. And so this is a pretty darn in-depth uh, study of that second movement of Beethoven's Sonata Pathetique, really analyzing it harmonically and then talking about some of the reharmonization possibilities um, that are inherent in it. So for instance, if I uh, bring up my lead sheet for it, uh, if I go my scores, Here's my lead sheet for the uh, Pathetique. Um, my first eight bars is basically just saying, oh, this is what Beethoven did. And then my next eight bars is some version of my uh, reharmonization of it. And then this is like the next theme. And it's it's a mixture of Beethoven's harmonization with a few of my own reharmonizations in here. Um, <clears throat> 
and uh, yeah so so and I talk about this in the video it's like this whole hour-long video is it an hour hour and a half or I, I forget how long all all told it is because I, I did it in like three parts also and um, so for instance uh, if I start playing here I thought I was starting to play there all right let me try to play here I think um, MuseScore.com doesn't know where I'm trying to start. So everything I'm doing here is, that's not Beethoven, right? Beethoven did not use those chords. But everything I'm doing in that reharmonization, I talk about in the video. Every, every single measure, every, every single chord that I put in there, I talk about, well, Here's what Beethoven had had here originally. Here's what it was doing. Here's how I abstract from that and say, well, I'm going to reharmonize it in this way and try to use techniques that he used, like this idea of using this minor four chord. I point out that Beethoven actually uses that minor four chord in a similar context somewhere else. So I'm not necessarily going outside of something that Beethoven would have done. And I, I talk about all that sort of stuff. And so those sorts of videos, I can just stuff in that master class without having to build a whole course around it. I can just say, you know what, I'm going to spend an hour making this video, not a year making a course, right? And then I make that court, I make that video, and I stuff it in that master class. So that's, um, that is like my short term, more advanced uh, material is um, through that music master class. And, and then, you know, I, I, I launched it officially like a month, a couple months ago, but was still totally wrapped up in this as well as doing things like preparing for the, uh, um, the convention I went to in Brussels, uh, um, a couple months ago or last month, whenever it was, I guess two months ago now. Um, and all, and then everything having to do with getting my, my, uh, teaching, uh, my Regis teaching, my, my actual regular university teaching online. It's just been crazy the last couple of months. But now that I'm done with this course, yeah, I'm going to continue posting more stuff to the Music Masterclass while I start developing more specific courses. So um, so the idea is, yeah, I would say the, the basic music theory course is the starting place. If you don't already really know this material, and even if you kind of sort of know it a little, I get pretty deep in, into it. Like, like I said, I'm really talking about why we, why the major scale is the way it is, and at, at a level that is <clears throat> more, um, I don't know, uh, uh, getting getting deeper into the material than you might typically get when when learning the material. Um, so definitely, you want to you want to go through that basic music theory course if you're not like really intimately familiar with it already. On the other hand, some of the stuff in the master class, I, I put a few videos in there that are just real short and not necessarily short, but simple, that don't require much uh, knowledge to know what I'm talking about. But some of them, like the, the pathetique one, is deep. I, I would say even the basic theory course doesn't complete you, completely uh, prepare you for this because there's a big gap between where the basic theory course leaves off and where this video starts that's going to be the stuff like the harmony course is going to help when i develop the harmony course it'll help fill the gap but yeah for the, for some of the material that's not as deep as this for some of the stuff in the in the um music master class i definitely think the basic music theory will give you the uh, foundation for it if I were to relate it to other things, like in the United States, we have uh, what's called advanced placement courses. They're like high school courses you take to help prepare you for college, and then you can get college credit for it. So there's an advanced placement music theory um, course that you can take that will allow you to get college credit for music theory. My basic music theory course is not that. It's the course you take to prepare you for 
a college music theory course. So it's not designed to replace a college music theory course, but to prepare you for one. Because a lot of times people come in, when I teach music theory um, at, the, at the university level, people often show up to day one of class not ready for a real music theory course because they don't know their major scales. You're supposed to already know that before you come into college, really. If you don't know your major scales and triads, you really should be boning up on that before you try to start a music theory course at the college level. And so my th my online course here, this basic music theory course, is really a college prep course is the way I would look at it. Um, because, yeah, it's the course that I wish I had when I was teaching, when I was teaching a music theory course, when we didn't have a college, we didn't have a prep course for it, it was really hard, because half the class I, I had to spend teaching them these basics. The other school where I teach right now, they have a, in fact, I developed my online course in conjunction with teaching this other course that is more of a pre-theory course. So, that's that. So, um, so yes, uh, Robert, um, this is, um, Wait a minute. Uh, will I be off? So yes, as I said, I, the uh, the the music master class is sort of this hodgepodge of things, and so there's one course called music master class, and I'm just going to keep posting videos to it. So far, I think I've posted three lessons to it, um, because I mentioned I've been really busy these last couple months, but now it's going to be more of my focus. I'll probably do a lesson or maybe every other week or so. It depends on how if I get more people who are like posting their own music because I want people to l listen to the lesson and then say, oh, now I'm inspired to do my own thing and then post their own stuff in response so I can critique that. So there's, I, I want it to be more of a dialogue than just me putting stuff out there. But I'm going to just keep putting stuff out there. So I'll, I'll keep putting stuff out there every week or two. Um, but it's all one thing, the music master class, and I'll just keep adding lessons to it. So then the... Advanced theory, again, I'm going to have, I think, separate courses. I'll probably have a harmony course, and that'll probably be the first of the bunch that I do. And then I'll probably have a voice, well, I don't know if I'll have a separate voice leading and counterpoint course, or if I'll connect them somehow. I'm, you know, the details of exactly how these courses are going to come together, I really need to put a lot of thought into doing it right, which is why I like the music masterclass idea, because I don't have to have a big overarching plan. I can just take it week by week and put some stuff out there that, that sounds like, you know, what people actually want week to week. So that's um, that's kind of what's going on. So yeah, the, um, the, the master class will definitely have, and, and what I'll probably do is I'll start trialing, like if I know I'm going to do a, a, a harmony course, I'll probably start putting harmony lessons into the music master class first. And as I kind of work out my ideas, get responses to them and stuff. So it'll be uh, um, probably most of the stuff that's in the harmony course will get covered through the music master class, you know, starting, you know, that's probably the next thing. I'm, probably the next thing I'm going to do is post um, uh, an, a lesson to the music master class where I start getting into the study of harmony. Um, so anyhow, that's when I say the next thing, I don't mean like later today, but I mean that like maybe next week I will get on that. So um, I don't know. Those are, that's that's stuff that I wanted to tell you about stuff, stuff about uh, what the what I think theory is, what I think it's good for. It's what enables me to do things like these reharmonizations. It's what enabled me to do things like write that kind of fugue section in that big band chart. It's what enables me to improvise. Um, at the, you, you, you're not actually seeing me improvise here. Well, this is partially improvised because this is really just me playing from that lead sheet. Um, so it's not all written out note for note, but I did kind of work out how I was going to voice these chords and stuff. Not note for note exactly, but uh, if, yeah, if I played it again, it would be pretty similar. Um, but yeah, as a jazz improviser, just totally inventing new melodies to chord progressions and reharmonizing the chord progressions on the fly while I do it. Yeah, that's a thing. And that's definitely a thing that's totally informed by theory. And uh, there's just so much that one can learn about how music is, is put together that enables you to create music. And, okay, so just one more little sort of pep talk about the value of, uh, yeah, you too, Colleen, I miss, miss, miss those. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll have something to say about CJW. Uh, <clears throat> you'll be hearing something shortly. I'm going to try to do like a, a, a theory workshop or an improv workshop or something for a Colorado Jazz workshop uh, soon. Um, so um, the, I was, I was going to, I had a point to make about the value of learning this. And it's, it's that some people are afraid, like, oh, if I learn all these rules, then I'm going to sound like everyone else. And it's actually 
It, it's really the other way around. What happens is, like I said, whether I know gravity or not, when I drop that phone, it falls, right? I'm not immune. Knowledge doesn't make you immune to the law of gravity. You're, 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 you are subject to it, no, like it or not. So it's the same with harmony. I don't care if anyone ever taught you that five likes to resolve to one. You look at all the pop songs ever written from people who never had any musical training, and I guarantee they have five to one in their songs. It's just a thing. It's a, it's If you rely on your ear and you don't have any theory knowledge, you're going to hear that. You're going to hear five going to one. You're going to hear all, you're going to hear the basic things because that's the way it is. Just like phones drop when you drop them, whether you know about the law of gravity and how it works or not. So you're going to do the expected things, whether you're taught the theory or not. But the problem is you're only going to do the most common, the simplest of them. Things like that, uh, I mentioned this um, idea of, uh, the um, uh, augmented sixth chord. This measure right here. That. Bum. The E7 chord I have going here. Beethoven did not use that chord there. So that passage. So he didn't write that E7 there, but he used an augmented sixth chord elsewhere in the sonata. And I point that out in the video, and I show another place where he used that sound. So he, he definitely was a fan of that augmented sixth chord sound. In jazz, we call this a tritone substitution, but it's the same sound. And the, the, the deal is, this is a lovely sound. Beethoven used it. Jazz musicians use it. No one, almost no one, who hasn't been taught how to make that sound ever stumbles on it. We might hear it and go, wow, that's really beautiful, but we don't know how to do it ourselves. And so we don't, because you're never going to stumble on that sound all by yourself. Uh, okay, someone had to stumble on it the first time. That person, uh, I don't know who that person was, but I, I'll buy him a beer um, if I ever run into him. Um, uh, but yeah, that was like 400 years ago at least. Um, so... Uh, well, no, it probably was just about 400 years ago that the first time anyone ever ever used that sound. Um, so there's certain sounds that are really beautiful sounds that we can hear this sound in Beethoven. We can hear it in jazz. You can hear it in, I, I, I'm pretty sure if I hunted through the Beatles music hard enough, I would find one of those or two of those somewhere. There's certainly other, you know, relatively advanced harmonic techniques that I can hear in Paul McCartney tunes. Um, I can't swear that he ever uses an augmented sixth chord. Can't swear to it. But yeah, someone else does. Um, uh, there are sounds that we would hear and go, yeah, that's a really beautiful sound, but I don't know how to make it. I've never tried to do it. But in, once you're shown, now you know how to create it and you can do it when you want. And I use that sound, I think, three times in this piece. You do it too much, it's a little overdone. Now I did it more than three times. I probably did it at least a half a dozen times. But um, so the, the, one of the values of theory is getting you past the obvious. Because if you don't know the theory, you're typically only going to do the obvious. You're going to use mostly diatonic chords. You're not going to have accidentals used to create more harmonic richness. Uh, things like what Beethoven does here of having an F7 with an A natural in the melody to lead to that B flat minor chord. Time-honored technique, been around for centuries. A lot of people never stumble on that without some exposure to theory. and uh, But this is a really basic, really important one, the secondary dominant. That's actually probably what would the, the subject of my first uh, harmony lesson would be about secondary dominance. The five chord of the two chord. So anyhow, th th this is one of the values of theory to me is... is teaching you what some of these interesting sounds are that people have been using that you're unlikely to stumble on yourself in your own composition or your own improvisation or whatever, your own music making. Um, so the, the goal is to help you find sounds that you're going to like because you've heard them before and you've liked them when you've heard them and show you how to make those sounds because you're, you're even the best people who play by ear tend to find they make good use of a limited palette, is what I would say. Um, sometimes really good use of that limited palette, and sometimes it's a surprisingly sophisticated palette. But it's usually pretty easy to tell the difference between uh, the harmonic language used by musicians who have been taught some of the theory versus those who haven't. The ones who haven't will do a good job, if they're, if they're good, will do a good job with a relatively limited palette, but you'll be able to say, hey, look, they never use that. 
That's funny. They never used Elizabeth and Crimson. Um, or they never used the uh, augmented sixth chord, and you'd eventually notice that there was a sound missing from uh, from their music, and it could still be great music. But yeah, why not take that other? Why not get that other color on your palette and know how to use that also? So that's my pep talk on on the value of theory. <sighs> All right, been talking a lot, and um, I think I will wrap up here. Um, so yeah, I I I, I continue. I'm gonna continue to do these uh, live uh, YouTube things because they're really uh, valuable. I think they're they're fun. YouTube is great for this. But I, I will say I've been using Zoom a bunch lately, um, and I there's things that are nice about doing Zoom things, and so I'll probably try to do some sort of workshops and things using Zoom in the future um, as well, and just kind of play around with different options. But. Uh, um, yeah, because like I was all excited when I figured out how to do YouTube live, and I, I was able to have Philip Rothman in as a guest and have him like share the screen. But that that, that stuff's trivial in Zoom, right? So because uh, you've probably most of you now in the last month have been introduced to Zoom, it's like taking over the world, at least in the online education world. But so far, I've had like a reunion with my cousins on Zoom and stuff like. And it's like, yeah, it it's a it's a cool product, and there's a you know a couple others out there also. So the other ways of doing. Um, video kind of chat things um so anyhow um feel free to be passing me other ideas uh for cafe topics for certainly uh for music master class ideas uh go ahead and sign up you don't sign up for the music master class directly it's you sign up for the all access membership on my site um so you would do that i'll, I'll post links but uh if you go to all courses you'll see that there's um <clears throat> this all access membership there and then that gives you access to the music master class because i figured I, I yeah that just it made more sense to me to do it that way anyhow um clarinet zoom lesson cool um all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up here and um and i uh, yeah we'll see you next week and find something new to talk about i keep thinking musecore 3.5 is coming fairly soon or at least a beta for it will be because we keep adding all, we keep merging pull requests, meaning fixing bugs and adding little minor new features and stuff, and it's it's shaping up to be a, a fairly big minor release. So um, I look forward to being able to talk about that when uh, when whenever we do do a beta release. So that'll either be a topic maybe next week, maybe two weeks, who knows? All right. Um, so uh, I hope you're uh, having you're all staying safe and healthy. I'll make sure I post some. Uh, links over into the thing here let me just uh get my here this is the easiest way to do this i'm just going to make sure i put in the school link because i already put in the course link right so if i just put that in there that's pretty good but i'll i'll, I'll specifically put in a link to the music master class so you can read up about it and see the samples and see if it seems like it's something interesting but it's it's as i said it's just kind of um, getting underway because I just put it online recently and then kind of the world changed out from under us um, and then I had to like really uh, push to finish that uh, basic music theory course but now I'm going to get back to just doing some fun things in here so all right everyone stay safe stay healthy and uh, talk to you soon okay bye <laughs>